Today we will continue our discussion uh, that we had started yesterday on uh, mixers, right. If you may recollect, we said that as far as this component um, multiplication is concerned, in which is the basic component, uh, you know, multi multiplier, which is the basic component required for modulation and mixing. This can be realized in several ways. And one method was to use a nonlinear device which has some nonlinear characteristics, right? For example, uh, the device with in which the current voltage characteristics have a nonlinear behavior, right? Like we have in junction diodes or the PN junction of a transistor. So, based on this principle, uh, we can see that if you apply the input voltage, which is a sum of two voltages one of which could be your which, which you want to multiply basically. Because of the nonlinearity present the output current would have some product terms right and if you can ensure that by suitable filtering you can uh, you can take out only the desired product term and reject all other components you have your uh, the purpose is achieved right. So, I will leave this at this point. Uh, for practical circuits based on this principle I would like you to uh, refer to books. The, the second kind of mixers that uh, we, ca we can have is uh, based on the switching principle which also I believe you have some idea of and we will just quickly first review what you might already know. So, we are looking at some uh, methods of heterodyning today or mixing. And in particular, we look at first the switching modulator, which is very simple. In its simplest form, it consists of an ideal diode followed by a resistance the, at the input to which you apply the sum of the two voltages which you want to multiply or mix right. So, one, one of them let us say is the carrier C of t and the other is the message M of t. Since the diode is considered to be ideal if you look at the behavior of the output voltage as a function of uh, the diode conducting or not conducting, basically the diode will go through two phases of operation. In the, in the normal mode, when uh, in the forward bias mode, it will act as a perfect short between the input and the output, and the output voltage V naught T would be simply equal to the input voltage at that time. So, when the diode is perfectly conducting the output is simply the input and which is nothing but the sum of the two voltages that you are applying the carrier and the message. When the diode is reverse biased the output voltage is 0 if let us say this is connected to ground okay which essentially means that now basically we have to now see when does the diode conduct and when it does not conduct. To ensure that uh, and to get the required multiplication effect that we want what we will impose we will put impose a constraint that the carrier is all the time or most of the time much larger than the message signal. The carrier amplitude is much larger than the message signal right. If that assumption is true then it is clear that whether the diode is forward biased or reverse biased will be essentially dependent on the carrier voltage right. So, whenever the carrier voltage is carrier is going through a positive half cycle right the diode will be reverse uh, forward biased and the <coughs> output voltage will be nothing but equal to the input voltage. When the carrier waveform is going through its negative half cycle it is less than 0 the diode will be reverse biased and the output voltage will be 0. So, this is a kind of switching of switch, switching action basically what you are doing is you are getting an output voltage which is a product of the input voltage 
and a 1 0 sequence right. In this half you are multiplying the input voltage with 1, in this half you are multiplying the input voltage by 0 right. So, it is as if your, your output voltage V naught T is the product of the input voltage waveform C T plus M T. Of course, this is not the product that you want or apparently want, but actually it leads to the same effect. This is being multiplied by a switching function or a square wave function which we call G sub T naught T right, which looks like this. Before I say about, about G T naught T, let us substitute for the carrier which could be of this kind plus the message waveform M T. Right, where G T naught T is a periodic waveform which looks like this. So, for half the carrier cycle, you are multiplying with 1, right. So, G T naught T is 1 during that half cycle, for the other half cycle, it is 0, and then again it is 1, again it is 0. So basically this is the kind of function with which you are multiplying the input voltage which is the C T plus M T waveforms. This is the nature of where the period of this waveform is T naught which is equal to 1 by F C the carrier period right. Now this does not conclude our discussion because we do not want this we want a product between these two right. Fortunately that is possible when we realize that this periodic square wave can be expanded in terms of a Fourier series and without going through the details all of you know what the Fourier series of a square wave is it contains only odd harmonics. Since this is a square wave which goes through as, uh, which, which goes through an excursion between 0 and 1 it will also have a DC component it is not a uh, it is not a 0 mean square wave right. So, there is a DC component which is equal to half plus 2 by pi this is the Fourier series which I am not computing here, but which all of you know and easily compute this these are the coefficients of the Fourier series minus 1 to the power n minus 1 upon 2 n minus 1 and this is a cosine wave of frequency. F C into 2 n minus 1 right. This is the uh, 2 n minus 1 th odd harmonic right. So, it will have harmonics at the fundamental corresponding to n equal to 0 uh, n, is, n is equal to 1 right because you are going from 1 to infinity third harmonic corresponding to n equal to 2 and so on and so forth right. So, if you now look at this product V naught T is the product of this into this Fourier series and as you can see this product if you look at uh, if you if you were to have a band pass filter following this system if suppose you follow this up with a band pass filter right. So, your V naught T is coming here you follow this up with a band pass filter. and the output V of T will contain only those terms which are close to this which, which, which are allowed by the band pass filter right. Let us say the band pass filter is tuned to the to pass frequencies in the neighborhood of F C right. So, the output V T in this case would be look at the product terms which will be at, at frequency F C. There is this constant half which will multiply with A C cosine omega C T right and there is this message M T which when multiplied with the first term of the Fourier series will produce a component at omega C or around omega C right. All other components in this term when multiplied with either this or this would lead to frequency components which are multiples of omega C right 2 omega C 3, 3 omega C whatever right. 
they will all be rejected by this plan pass filter. So, the final output V of t would therefore be nothing but uh, you can write this as A c by 2 I am just writing these two components into 1 plus 4 by pi A c m t into cosine 2 pi f c t which is your desired out uh, modulated signal. Okay. This contains a carrier component plus the DSBSC component that you are looking for. The modulation index is 4 by pi A c in this device. Right. So, this generates an AM signal. Okay. So, this is fine. Now, suppose we wanted a pure DSBSC signal without the carrier component we can still apply the switching idea. The only difference we need to somehow create is that instead of multiplication of alternate uh, half with alternate half cycles with 1 and 0 we need to multiply the input waveform with plus minus 1 to make this waveform, uh, waveform zero, uh, 0 mean. The DC component of this waveform should become 0 so that this factor half does not appear which multiplies with the carrier component <coughs> in the other term and that is precisely done by a device called the ring modulator. Or the balanced diode modulator. Okay. The typical circuit will look something like this. Would have been like this. So, this is a balanced modulator, it is also called a ring modulator. Uh, the reason being that the these diodes all face in the same direction as you trace the diodes they are all point in the same direction right. <coughs> so, if you go along these diodes they form a ring in some sense. So, we call it a ring modulator right. So, we apply the we, we center tap these transformers here and apply the carrier voltage C of t at these points. And your modulating waveform m of t is applied here. The message waveform m of t is applied here, and this is your output voltage, the modulated signal. Let's call it s of t. The principle is more or less the same. When C of t is the positive half cycle, two of these diodes conduct and two of them are reverse biased, two of them are forward biased. For example, when when let us say it is in this cycle, but this terminal is positive with respect to this, that positive half cycle, which diodes will conduct? These two, right, and these two will be reverse biased as you can see, right. Because this this end will be at a higher voltage than this end, and therefore it will be reverse biased. Similarly for this. Remember that we are assuming that for this discussion that these transformers are short circuits in that sense. So more or less we are assuming that this point is directly connected to this point. In that, in, in, so we are assuming that the impedance offered by these diodes at the carrier frequency is very small. 
right. Similarly, so when, when these two diodes are conducting basically what you are going to get is this voltage which is a sum of once again the carrier voltage and the input voltage appears across this and therefore they across the output directly. In fact more or less you can say that empty directly appears in this case because CT is actually balanced out right there is no net, net carrier applied from here to here right as you can convince yourself the carrier voltage appearing between these two trans transformer term if the transformer is perfectly balanced if the center tab exists precisely in the middle of the winding right there will be uh, net zero voltage of uh, due to carrier here and similarly net zero voltage due to the carrier here across these two terminals. So basically this voltage empty assuming this is unity gain or whatever will appear across this output and therefore at the output right. So you will get empty multiplied with 1 at the output in this case. When the carrier is in the other direction right now which diodes will conduct these two diodes will conduct these two will be switched off. What is happening now instead of empty reaching this point here the, uh, the, uh, the basically the polarity the connections are reversed right. So as if you are changing the sign of empty right the positive voltage is going down and the, I mean in a, in a manner of speaking and the negative voltage is right. So effectively the, uh, the connection between the input and output is uh, crossed right and therefore that is equivalent to multiplication of empty with minus 1 right. So if you were to plot this waveforms basically what we are saying is something like this maybe this is a better place to plot assume we are, this is your modulating waveform and to <coughs> show the switching action basically what we are saying is we are multiplying with this, this waveform with these positive and negative pulses or this square waveform which goes between plus 1 and minus 1 and the output would be a waveform like that. Of course this switching will be at a much higher rate than I have shown in this picture because this is a carrier frequency. So this switching is taking place at the carrier frequency which is a high frequency. So you will get something like that. Right. So during this time you are multiplying with plus 1. So whatever is appearing across the empty here is goes across like that. During this interval you are multiplying with minus 1 so you get something like that. The same message waveform appears with a negative sign and so on and so forth. etc. So you get a modulated waveform which looks like this of course once again the carrier here does not appear to be sine wave it appears to be a square wave right. So what should I do if you remember the, the basic theory remains the same empty is multiplied with the square wave, square wave con contains this fundamental component and its harmonics odd harmonics. So the, we want only the component which is a product of this empty with the first harmonic of this right. So what should we do simply pass this through a bandpass filter tuned to the carrier frequency FC. So this output this ST when passed through the bandpass filter will produce the perfectly balanced empty cosine 2 pi f c t that you want with a scaling factor of suitable value right. So that is a balanced modulator for us for this to be balanced these transformers need to be perfectly balanced so that the carrier component does not appear at the output right so that the net voltage due to the carrier here and here is zero. <coughs> So we require and also these diodes should be identical right 
if they have a finite if they are ideal there is no problem but if they are non ideal they should have more or less the same value of the forward resistance right. So those are the requirements for making them balanced. <coughs> You can similarly have other circuits I think I just wanted to give you a flavor of the kind of things that we can do to generate both <coughs> AM signals as well as uh, DSPSC signals right. Having generated any one of them one can then generate either the SSP signal or the VSP signal by appropriate sideband filter okay. Any questions? If not then the last topic that I am going to take with amplitude modulation for the time being I will return to envelope detection once again. Remember envelope detector is one of the most commonly used detectors for amplitude for detecting amplitude modulated signals right. Commonly used because most of the time when you use amplitude modulation particularly in broadcast applications you are using it uh, in the amplitude in the, with the carrier right it is DSP AM which has a carrier component so as to make the envelope proportional to the message waveform m of t right and the easy, the, the idea is to have a very simple demodulator using a diode and two rc uh, one resistance and one capacitance right the diode detector now when you use this device for detection uh, we must be aware that there are some limitations of this device and that limitation is what I want to talk about right now. That limitation typically arises in the presence of interference right. If there is an interfering signal present along with the desired signal then under certain conditions the interfering signal can take over the output rather than the desired signal right and that is something that we must understand. So I like to spend some time on the effect of diode uh, how, how the diode detector works in the presence of interference. Now at the moment I am not taking in interference to be noise, noise analysis is something we will do separately right. At the moment I am talking of another interfering signal as the interference right. For example let us say just to uh, put the this interference idea in a proper perspective we discussed the super heterodyne receiver yesterday right and we said that unless you unless you design your RF filter properly there is a possibility of the image frequency component coming through at the input to the IF filter right and uh, if that does if, if that happens because it will happen at the, that image frequency component will nearly appear at the image IF intermediate frequency itself and the intermediate frequency filter would not be able to reject it right because it is in the neighborhood it is in the neighborhood of the intermediate frequency. So maybe <coughs> excuse me maybe you have a desired signal omega c desired signal of frequency which is a modulated signal around the frequency omega c right along with that we, we get an image frequency component if your RF filter is not good enough that is likely to happen right. So for example it could be the image frequency component <coughs> of course this will not happen if your RF filter is designed to reject at least the image frequency right. But even if this was not the case there can be situations where an undesired transmitter is located very close to the frequency of interest. Let us say that you are trying to receive a transmitting station at a certain carrier frequency and there is an there is an interfering transmitter which is also located in the same neighborhood or in the neighborhood of your receiver. It may be not it may not be in the neighborhood of your transmitter but it may be in the neighborhood of your receiver transmitting something else. It may be an undesired transmission it I mean sometimes you have an RF equipment it is not supposed to transmit but there is a leakage right you have a receiver and there is a leakage coming from this equipment which which works at that radio frequency which has an internal operation at that radio frequency and uh, some components uh, may uh, radiate some power 
and that power will be getting into your receiver right and that will appear as a, in the form of an interference right. So that is why we call it a tonal interference tonal because there is a sine wave of cosine wave of a frequency close to the carrier frequency which is directly coming in into your receiver along with your carrier frequency right. So basically what we are saying is that we have a received signal x sub r t which contains the carrier of interest it contains the modulated signal of interest and for the purpose of discussion here I am taking the modulated signal to be a m cosine omega m t right and so this is a m cosine omega m t into cosine omega c t these two are the desired components out of which eventually I want to get output at, at the envelope detector output I want a m cosine omega m t. I want something proportional to the message signal I am taking this to be the message signal MT right but along with these two things which is the carrier the model the DSPSC part this for example this could be the AM signal that I am receiving these two together along with this I am getting an interfering signal of amplitude A sub i into cosine of omega C plus omega i. okay that is a tone a pure tone the <coughs> cosine wave of frequency omega c plus omega i where omega i is close to omega c and is therefore not rejected either by the RF filter or by the IF filter. So there is this interference present hmm? at the output of the RF filter uh, mixer this will produce a tone at frequency uh, okay um, l l think of this as the output of the um, IF right intermediate stage intermediate frequency stage so this is the IF amplifier output in which case basically what we are saying is that this omega c that I am talking about here is the intermediate frequency right. So in any case <coughs> there is a very closely located signal which is not rejected by the IF filter and that is coming along with your desired signal and what will be the stage following the IF stage the diode detector you will try to detect your message signal by passing this through a diode detector. So we like to now study what happens if the input to the diode detector is not this waveform which would have been the normal thing but this corrupted with this interference is it clear what we are trying to do. So um, suppose we have coherent before we talk about uh, diode detector let us talk about coherent detector what would the coherent demodulator produce right what will the coherent demodulator produce. So remember this is the undesired signal undesired interfering tone so both omega c plus omega i and omega c will be passed into same frequency omega i f no no i am um, think of this omega c as omega i f okay. right normally you at the at the output of the i f filter you would only got a carrier at the i f frequency and both here as well as here but along with that you are also getting a close by tone which the i f filter cannot reject think of omega c here as omega i f right so this interfering tone is close to that omega i f and therefore it cannot be rejected <coughs> all right so uh, can you say what will be the output of the coherent demodulator The coherent demodulator will produce an output corresponding to this, right? Which will be equal to so y dt. I'm not going through the details because these are things that you now understand very well, right? You are multiplying this with cosine omega ct and then no pass filtering the result. You will get am cosine omega mt. Maybe with some scaling factor which I'm ignoring here, right? But you'll also get something here. 
right you will get something proportional to a i cosine omega i t right. So, even the current demodulator even in the current demodulator you will get an output corresponding to this image uh, interfering frequency present in the input signal right. So, even the current detector would not work perfectly in that sense right not only you get your desired signal, but you get your tone the interfering tone <coughs> of frequency omega i is that clear. However, the amount of this interference that you will see at the output will be directly proportional to the amount of interference present at the input which is something that we we accept as communication engineers right. We call this a graceful behavior right the output is as bad or as good as the input let us put it that way input is bad your output is bad right we cannot do very much about it. So, it is output is directly proportional output interfering component is directly proportional to the input interfering component right. So, that is what the coherent demodulator will, will do. Now, how about the envelope detect detector? To see this it is useful to take recourse to the phasor diagram, phasor diagram, phasor, phasor diagram representation of this signal that we are talking about here. And let us first look at the phasor diagram uh, ok first let us draw the write the whole expression let us write this in the form of complex exponentials because for phasor diagrams it is better to work with complex exponentials right. So, you can think of the received signal x r x sub r t as the real part of now the first term was a c cosine omega c t. So, it is a real part of a sub c e to the power g omega c t that is the carrier component right. Then there is this interfering component which is at frequency omega c plus omega i right the cosine omega c plus omega i that is a sub i real part of e to the power j omega c t into e to the power j omega sub i t right because this is omega c plus omega i. And then there is, there is a modulated component right what are the comp uh, there are two side bands present here one at frequency omega c plus omega m and the other at frequency omega c minus omega m right. So, what are the corresponding phasor components? So, this is plus half a sub m e to the power j omega c t into e to the power j omega m t plus half a sub m e to the power j omega c t into e to the power minus j omega sub m t right. So, the real part of all this is that signal which you can write as the real part of take e to the power j omega c t term out in common because that is present in every one of these terms. A sub c plus a sub i e to the power j omega i t plus half a m e to the power j omega m t plus half a m e to the power minus j omega m t. and we like to draw if uh, represent this signal x r t in terms of a phasor diagram. <coughs> do you know how to do that? I am sure all of you know that, but just to recapitulate first of all it will be convenient to only look at this square bracketed term. We, we can ignore this e to the power j omega c t because you can think that your phasor diagram is being drawn in a reference frame which is rotating at a carry at the at the frequency omega c right. So, everything every term is rotating at that frequency. So, you can now think as if as far as these components are concerned you are working in a stationary framework right. So, if everything is rotating with, then with respect to this it is stationary right. So, we will only therefore, look at 
these components and draw the phasor diagram corresponding to these. To understand what is happening let us first draw the phasor diagram without the interfering component. This is the interfering component right. So let us see what, what is happening to the received signal what is the nature of the received signal as represented on the phasor diagram without the interfering component okay. So what will you get? You have this carrier phasor with amplitude A sub C right. Then you do not have this because we are saying this is at the moment we are not considering this. We have these two sideband phasors right. With respect to this carrier phasor which is actually rotating at omega C but the, if the whole frame is rotating it will appear to be fixed right. This is appearing this is rotating faster than the carrier phasor right. So with respect to the carrier phasor it is having a rotation at the speed of omega m radians per second let us say in a counterclockwise direction. So plus omega m let us say means rotating in a counterclockwise direction which I will denote rotating like this right it is going round and round around the carrier oh I am sorry all right let me take this to be minus omega all right correct and then it does not matter you can take any one of them as clockwise in the this is a matter of uh, notation this is what you will get one phase are rotating like this the other phase are rotating like this right and what you will see the actual signal will be the resultant of all these three phases right. Now no matter where this rotation is it is symmetrical with respect to the carrier phase at any time t if at any time t <coughs> this phase will make an angle omega m t with respect to the carrier phase this phase will make an angle minus omega m t right. So they are symmetrically placed with respect to the carrier phase and therefore the resultant wave by your parallelogram method etc would appear like this right r of t the resultant will always be along this line is that clear it will the resultant r t will fluctuate around a c on both sides for example at this position the resultant will lie here right. So basically what you will see is that the carrier wave is mod is being modulated in amplitude around AC right it is going up and down in proportional to the message signal cosine omega m t right is that clear. So that is how the whole thing is working and the envelope detector will actually follow this you can think of this r of t the resultant amplitude as the envelope this is the envelope that you will try to trace through the envelope det detector it will be sensitive to this envelope amplitude envelope value <coughs> right. So the envelope detector output here is proportional to r of t and since r of t here will be proportional to cosine omega m t this will be proportional to cosine omega m t as we expect it to be right there is no problem about that. I hope all of you are with me on this. Now let us see how things change if we also introduce a sub i e to the power g omega i. How will how will you modify the phasor diagram anyone would like to comment when this this component also has to be considered. So we start with the same uh, starting point that is you have a carrier component A sub C carrier phasor and then what do you have? e to the power j omega i right so it is rotating let us say like this sorry like this right at a frequency of omega i radius right and now at, at this point you are superimposing the two side bands right which will look like this 
because with respect to the carrier they still have the same configuration right. They, they are omega m t and minus omega m t and they will form an angle of plus omega m t and minus omega m t with respect to the carrier not with respect to this. So, they will look like this right and their resultant is something here and the overall resultant is where overall resultant would be this waveform and this phasor r of t. So, your r t the overall resultant is this now is that clear so what are the things that you can see that now the resultant phasor is not along the carrier phasor is therefore it is not undergoing only amplitude variations amplitude variations will be there as all these phasors rotate as this rotates and these two rotate the amplitude also will keep varying right but in addition there is also a phase variation right theta of t. So, these two variations are being introduced. So, the issue is what is the nature of this envelope what can we say about this envelope it is very difficult in general to visualize what is happening. Hmm? but it is not that difficult to visualize under some simplifying assumptions right. So, let us study the behavior of this envelope under some simplifying assumptions by envelope I mean the length of this vector right the amplitude the amplitude is what will be important when we are looking at the output of the envelope detector because the envelope detector will produce an output proportional to the instantaneous amplitude of the <coughs> carrier wave right ok. So, to do that let me return to my original expression x sub r t is equal to a sub c this all I did all this just to make you give you a feel for the end uh, phasor representation of the signals which is important as we will see later it is very important particularly when we want to do the noise analysis both for AM as well as for FM signals. So, the phasor representation is something I wanted to introduce at an early stage so that you get used to it. So, let us come back to your old expression AC cosine omega CT plus AM cosine omega MT cosine omega CT plus the interfering term also let me write as if you remember it is cos omega c plus omega i right which I can write as cosine omega c t cosine omega i t minus <coughs> sin omega c t sin omega i t <coughs> and you know why I did this what is the motivation for writing like this because I like to express this received signal in the quadrature representation any narrow band signal we know we can write in quadrature form right there is an in phase part which is multiplied with cosine omega c t and there is a quadrature phase part which is multiplied with sin omega c t. If I have it in the quadrature form I can easily identify the nature of the envelope by taking the square root of uh, modulus of the uh, thing right. So, it will be what is the in phase part it will be a c plus a m cosine omega c t uh, cosine omega m t plus a i cosine omega i t this whole thing multiplying cosine omega c t right. I have collected all the terms containing cosine omega c t together minus the quadrature part which is a i sin omega i t into sin omega c t. So, we would like to understand the nature of this envelope under at least some simplifying assumptions in general it is little difficult to appreciate ok. What can we say? Let me make the simplifying assumption that 
let us take case 1 that a sub c is much greater than a sub i this is a simplifying assumption right you are saying that a sub c is much greater than a sub i. Now we have had some discussion of the behavior of the envelope detector under under these kinds of conditions. Do you remember we discussed this in some other context? In the context of demodulation of SSB and VSB signals by the carrier reinsertion method, right? This is the same kind of situation here. If this is much greater than this, the envelope will be dominated by which term? The first term, right? Because you take the square of this and the square of this, add them up and take the square root, right? But the square root, square of this will be much smaller than the square of this. You can ignore it, and therefore, essentially, it becomes a square root of the square of this term, right? Therefore, in this case, the second term is negligible. and your demodulated output if you forget the DC component right A sub C will be the DC component in the demodulated output which is of no consequence we can ignore that will be A sub M cosine omega MT plus A sub I cosine omega IT which is perfectly fine it, this is precisely what we got when we use the Coherent demodulator, if you remember, some time ago we discussed that, right? This is precisely the output that was produced by the coherent demodulator, so no problem. So, under the situation that the uh, but only thing is here we have obtained this result under an assumption. What is there? There was no assumption, that is the difference. The assumption here is that the interfering component is much smaller than the signal component, the carrier part. Right. So the carrier there was we are make the we had to make no such assumption for the coherent demodulator. It will always produce this output. Right. No matter what is the value of uh, AM and AI. If AI is large, of course the output will be large. This will be large. If AI is small, the output will be small. That's true even here. But for this to work like this, what we are saying is the carrier component must be much greater than the interfering component that is what you are saying. To appreciate the significance of this assumption let us take the opposite situation okay. The opposite situation is that A C is much less than A sub I okay. Now we look at this expression what will you get it is difficult to say directly from this. So what we do is we slightly manipulate this expression once again this expression for XRT hmm. difficult to say because A sub i is appearing here as well as here is not it that is why it is difficult to see what is happening. If it was appearing in only one of these two terms it would have been very easy to say but since A sub i is appearing in both these terms and A i is very large. <coughs> is difficult to say directly from this. So what we do is slightly re-manipulate this expression as follows. I am writing the first term cosine omega ct as A sub c cosine this is a trivial kind of uh, thing that I am writing but it has a significance which we will soon see I am writing like this omega c plus omega i minus omega i right t then we have the interfering term which was a i cosine omega c plus omega i t right. I think very soon you will all see what I am trying to do and then a m cosine omega this is a moderated part a m cosine omega m t into cosine omega c plus omega i minus omega i same thing everywhere when I have only cosine omega c I am replacing it with omega c plus omega i minus omega i and I think now you probably already know what I am trying to achieve. I am going to write an expression in which the carrier is not 
omega c but omega c plus omega i that is basically what I am trying to do in this and the reason will become very clear. So, if you expand this now as cosine a plus uh, cosine a minus b t etcetera and then um, simplify maybe I can skip that trigonometry and give you the direct result directly because that is straightforward you get finally this expression. you get x sub r t is equal to a sub i plus a sub i uh, sorry a sub c cosine omega i t plus a m cosine omega m t cosine omega i t into into cosine omega c plus omega i t plus a sub c sin omega i t plus a sub m cos sin omega m t sin omega i t into sin omega c plus omega i t. So, once again I have a quadrature representation. So, please assume this is correct this is just coming out of the so, important thing is instead of writing it in terms of quadrature quadrature representation using omega c I have used omega c plus omega i. Why did I do that? Now you can that will be obvious from here. As you can see this this second term now does not contain a sub i because earlier a sub i was present in both the terms now it is present only in the first term right. And Therefore, we can say that the first term will dominate the envelope detector output right because this is much larger than A c. We are saying that A sub i is a very large interference right. So, this term will dominate the output and therefore, you can say that your envelope detector will produce an output y sub d t which is approximately equal to if I forget the d c part right a sub i is some dc component a c cos sin omega i t plus a m cos sin omega m t cos sin omega i t. Now, this is very interesting if you look at it carefully hmm? what are the conclusions you can draw from this. First conclusion from this discussion is that as the envelope detector now thinks that the carrier is not omega c, but the carrier, the carrier is omega c plus omega i. So, in a way the stronger of the two components capture the envelope detector output right captures the receiver right. If the interfering component is stronger it captures the receiver it will produce and it, it will dictate what the output of the envelope detector, detector would be right rather than allowing the signal component to the carrier component to dictate right. And once it dictates that the output has no resemblance to the message signal that is the second conclusion. The output now is you see your message signal was containing a component at omega m right. So, uh, the input was there was a message component at frequency f m and there is an interference com interfering component at frequency f sub i right. If at the output I got these two components no problem that is what the coherent detector does it produces both these components at the output fine because the input contains interference the output should contain interference that is fine. However, what I am getting here is I do not get f m at all right so what you are going to get is is this component f sub i there is this component f sub i minus f m and f sub i plus f m. We do not even have a component at the desired signal frequency message frequency was f sub m there is no component in the output at the frequency f sub m. The interfering tone and plus minus f m these are the frequency components present in the output. 
they, therefore they bear no resemblance to the actual input signal right this output signal will be quite distorted so in a way the presence of a large interfering signal uh, degrades the uh, output to the extent that it as if modulating signal is actually modulating not the uh, is not coming out but it is modulating the interfering tone omega sub i. Right. So I think with I hope you understand then that the annual detector works very nicely as long as the interference is small but if in some situations the interference becomes large this does not work well that will be our conclusion for today thank you very much.